all right with you, I want to interrupt a regularly scheduled sermon. And uh, let's do a little party and a little praying. If you're wearing a red shirt, specifically a red shirt that says Magi on it, come on up. Come on up. Uh, we've got two of our crew heading to Honduras. And what they're taking is a little bit of your guys' handiwork, a little bit of what we've uh, accomplished here as a church family. I'm going to turn it in, turn it over to my hype man, Ernie. But uh, we want to pray. We want to pray these guys on their way. Uh, Aaron and Zach are going to be heading to Honduras, and they're going to be they're going to be the hands giving out uh, the Magi boxes. Ernie, take it. First of all, let's let me say that it's really glad to have my wife back. She's been gone for the summer visiting other health facilities. <laughs> Back with us. And she is the core of my job, believe me. Boy, she, I walk, walked into the office this, or the, uh, the room this morning, my job room, and I was ready to start packing again. The smell there just uh, overwhelming. So we're looking forward to a new year coming up soon. But right now, I just wanted to say that we got two guys, aren't them guys, <laughs> Zach and Aaron, are all packed and ready to go to Honduras and be our ambassadors there as they help give out gifts to the children. Now, you got to understand this is not gift, just gift for children. It's gifts to the parents also, because they may get to hear Jesus from the churches that are helping give these out to the children. So say we're not just going to give away, we're going to give them to tell the story of Jesus. That's what Magi is, making a godly impact. So let me just pray briefly for uh, us and for, uh, just bow with me, I'll just ramble as I pray. God, I just thank you so much for filling our hearts with the gift of, of, uh, that we receive the joy of giving to others. I thank you so much for this body of people and for the willing hearts that are so uh, filled with joy to help us send boxes to so many children and to spread your word wherever they go. These men are going in the their spouses are going to be praying for them, and, and we will be praying for them while they're gone. And I just pray that you'll give Aaron and uh, Zach an uh, unforgettable experience, that they can come back and share with us the joy that they see as the children receive the, the blessings and as the parents witness that also. You fill us in so many ways. You, you help us give in so many avenues. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll continue to give us the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the will to buy and give and, and share our lives with others so that we can share Jesus in, in doing so. And that's all our lives should be about. And I just pray that today that you will not only bless the men and the women who are, who are behind our effort here, but you'll be with our church as we look forward to a new year coming up soon. We look so much to serve you, and we pray, Lord, that everything we do will be done for Jesus. And we pray this all in his name. surround them, their families. I know this is not just the two guys going, but this impacts the whole family. And um, here's, here's what's awesome. Their hands are giving out uh, the gifts that your hands collected items and packed these boxes. So I think it is appropriate in this time to give a round of applause, to give a hand to an almighty God. So. Guys, we could make it all about us. We could. But man, we don't want to. It's all about the glory we have in our Father. It's all about the ability for us to turn and give. And uh, speaking of turning, I'm going to pull a 180 on you. So we, we're talking about giving. We're talking about good things. We're talking about life. As we turn to our final verse in, in Hebrews 11, talking about pilgrims, here's the flip I want to take. I want to I 
ask this question. As you have lived out your faith life, as you have walked along, at what point were you able to say, in the face of the world out amongst you, as the writer says in the Psalms, as Paul says in the letter to the Corinthians, in verse, chapter 15, this phrase, O oh, death, where is your sting? I mean, I, I, I've kind of taken full, full circle here. We're hitting fairly hard. Oh, death, where is your sting? Let me, let me give you an example and kind of my life. This process of, of, of looking at life, but yet at the same time realizing death is real and being able to say, oh, death, where is your sting? Uh, as, a, as a teenager, as a young teenager, uh, this my first time walking through this was losing my grandfather. And I remember being all, all torn up, and, and I was... Uh, I was a teenager, and it was just this is the first death that kind of impacted my life. You knew death happened, but this is the first one that really hit. And some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Different ages. Some of you, it's it's not until your 20s, 30s that there was really a death that impacted you. Some of you, it's been almost your whole life. There's been impactful deaths. But at some point, those of us who belong to the Lord, we can echo what the psalmist says. We can echo what Paul, what Paul says. Oh, death, where is your sting? I remember sitting, uh, it was a hallway, but it was just a wall of windows looking out the side of a hospital. And behind me, in the room behind me, was my, my papa, I mean, dying. Knowing that this was the end. Side point, I'm a teenager, and I'm like, he should live forever. This is how things should be, okay? That's, that was my maturity level at the time. But it hurt. And so I'm sitting there recognizing I'm not going to have any more time with him. I want a lot more time with him. And I'm just kind of looking out into the world. Just be like, is this what life is? Just people you love dying? And then my Uncle Arnold popped in. Uncle Arnold, he's a great uncle, and he is from Kentucky. This should solve some of your questions. And, and from my great uncles, they, they all kind of worked the land in Kentucky, and uh, he did as well, but he, he kind of ventured into selling tractors. He is the one that taught me how to ride a pig. That was fun. You know, this is kind of the, the upbringing I had. Go grab a pig and ride a pig, and I think I failed. Um, but I remember Uncle Arnold, as, as there's this emotional wave in the hallway, it's just a row of chairs looking out into the world, fully recognizing that in the wall behind you, people were, were passing away. Such a surreal moment, especially for my age. And Arnold, he pulls out his wallet. Mind you, you guys know this. There are people that have normal-sized wallets. And then there are people that carry every item that they own in their wallet. And he pulls it out and looks at me. And he says, did I ever show you my pride and joy? And I'm like, I don't want to talk right now. I'm kind of emotional. And he goes, hey, if I showed you my pride and joy, I'm assuming it's one of the pigs, maybe a tractor. I don't know. But Arnold then pulls out of his wallet this. And then, while, while holding this wallet-sized image of his pride and joy, he becomes, there's, a, there's a, a, a unique sound effect when you are chuckling and snorting at the same time. He thinks this is the funniest thing ever. He pops this thing out and he just starts I, don't, I can't even make that sound effect. You guys know what I'm talking about. You're like, do we, do we need a defibrillator here? What is happening? He's just rolling in it. And I am sitting there. I'm like, my, my papa's dying. And he's crying. And he's laughing. And it's just, it's just a ball of emotions. Have you seen my pride and joy? But I recognize there, not in the moment, but it's as you walk through moments and recognize moments. Oh, death, where is your sting? Because where I'm struggling in the there and now, my Uncle Arnold knows there is no sting in death. He knows that this is not goodbye. Because he knows that my papal is a lover of the Lord as he is. And as children of an almighty father, they will see each other again. And in the face of that, he can look out into the world holding a flimsy pride and joy picture and make the loudest chuckling sound in a room full of people all emotional. Oh, death, where is your sting? Now, see, uh, here's the thing, and, and I know this is it's kind of a 1950s image, 
And, and when I was trying to find this, I came across a lot of 1950s advertisements. And who of you lived through the 1950s? How? How did you... How did you do that? Because just looking at some of the advertisements, here's, here's, I'm just putting up one advertisement, okay? This is how things were sold in the 1950s. An ad for cellophane and a child is tied up and wrapped up, and not only that, there's a newborn too. Everything is best in cellophane, and I'm just thinking, man, that's a terrible advertisement. There is nothing in this advertisement that I think, yeah, I should go out and get some cellophane, Johnny's acting up, let's wrap it up. How did you guys make it? I, I think when they talk about the greatest generation, it's like, you survive. Great job. Everything is better than selfies. But I want to talk for a second about advertisements. And I want to look through, I want to, you know, as we're pilgrims, as we're walking, we, we kind of have some marching orders. We have a message. We have a method in which we as a family want to be walking. And it's the same for many churches around because it's, Biblical, and so here's the phrase we use, love, love, go. One foot in front of the other. A love of God, a love of people, and go make disciples. The two greatest commandments and the great commission. This is the lifeblood of Southgate. This is where we need to be. If you get lost, you come right back here and go, here are my steps. Love God, love people, go make disciples. But I want you to think for a second. As a child of God, we represent our Father to the unbelieving world. And so as we look at that go concept, as we talk about, as, as we get to send out magic boxes, as we get to go see people, that we are an advertisement for Jesus. We are the, we are the living Son on display for people to see, to come and know the Father. And, and I don't want to put a, a heavy burden on you. I don't want this to be like, oh no, I'm never going outside. I don't want anyone to ever see me. That's not what I'm after. But I want to say this. We would be a terrible advertisement for the Lord if we didn't walk confidently as his children. Okay? Can you imagine this advertisement? Hey, we love you to buy our product. Does it work? We don't know. Not sure. Is someone trying to sell you a cake? Does it taste good? I have no idea. I mean, those advertisements don't work. And we can be a terrible advertisement. We can be a terrible ad if we say we love God, but we're like, I don't know. I'm not quite sure if I'm there. And so I want you to think for a second. The way we walk in this life, living as pilgrims, we are an ad for Jesus. What does the term Christians mean? It means little Christs. We are to be Christians. We are to be those on display for Christ. Um, grab your Bibles. We are going to be digging through them today. And we're, uh, we're going to look at the four verses in Hebrews, but I've got a few other sections I want to hit. So if you've got the, uh, the leather bound or the apple bound, what would you call a, a screen? I don't know. Uh, but, but wherever your text is, grab it. We're going to go through it. The first part should be familiar. We have hit on this and talked about this in uh, Hebrews 11. And uh, Hebrews 11, if you're joining us, and, and maybe you do not recall where we're at, uh, it's kind of the Hall of Fame of Faith. Chapter 11 of Hebrews is, is just a recognition of those who walked by faith. And we're told at the beginning of Hebrews 11 that faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. That in faith we have assurance about things that we can not see. And that's how we walk. But I want to I read through these four verses. We're going to hit verse 16, but I want to offer up a prayer. Father, as we focus on faith, may, may we have a clear understanding of your word. May we see your glory. May we see your honor. Father, shine your light through your word this morning. In the name of King Jesus, I pray. So we're going to walk through these four verses, and, and then we'll touch verse 16. Starting verse 13, and I'm reading from the NLT up here. All these people, meaning those who had lived in faith, those referring to Noah, Moses, and the like, all these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance, 
and they welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Verse 14, obviously people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. And I want to pause there. If you were with us last week, pity that fool. Pity that fool that wants to go back. And in verse 16, the verse we're going to sit in today. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. And um, whatever version you're reading, there is a hinge statement or a hinge verse in there. In the NLT, it is, that is why. When you find these hinge words, you want to see what's on either end of the hinge. Okay, let me, let me explain. In NIV, it's therefore. Okay, you know the saying, when you see a therefore, find out what the therefore is there for. All right, and so we're looking on, on two sides of this hinge. We see instead they were looking for a better country, a heavenly home. So on one side, their destination, how they're walking, it's pilgrims. On the other side of this hinge, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Okay, because of their progress and walk in faith, God is not ashamed for them. He has something prepared for them. Let me clarify it a little bit better. I'm going to show you the message and how it breaks it down. Here's the two sides of the hinge. But they were after a far better country than that heaven country. You can see, you can see why God is so proud of them and has a city waiting for for them. I don't know why, but I go to the twang when I just want to say heaven country. They have a far better country than heaven country. You can see why God is so proud of them. It has a city waiting for them. Looking at the hinge, I want you guys to grasp this. When we are pilgrims, our pride. You, you guys catch whose pride this is? This is the pride of our Father. This is the pride of our, our God. I, I want to I stop here for a second because some of you, if I were to say, God loves you, you would nod your head. You'd, yes, he does. And if I were to say this statement, you would not nod your head. You'd stop. God is proud of you. God is proud of you. Is that, is that easy to accept? Is that something we need to hear? Or something like, yep, got it, let's move on. I, I don't think we grasp this. God is proud of you. We're going to talk about why, but I want to talk about what I talk about. I know transitions are fun today. When I'm visiting someone, when, I, when I'm at someone's house, sometimes conversation rolls. It, it is easy. There's other times where conversation is hard. There is two things I look at, and no matter what, I can start a conversation. You know what those two things are? Fridges and frames. If I'm at your place, I can look at your fridge, I can look at your frames, and we have something to talk about. You know why? Because what's important to us, we will put on the fridge or we will put in a frame. That A-plus paper, put that thing on the fridge. That beautiful family portrait, put that in a frame. I don't think any of you have framed photos of things you don't care about in your house. If I were to go, what's that? Go, I don't know, it just showed up. That's not something we do, okay? We are very intentional about what's in the frames. Now, I'm gonna hear later after the sermon, somebody's like, hey, I've got a frame, I don't even know who the people are. That's fine, you're weird, and we'll talk about that. But frames serve a purpose, and the purpose is we put in things that we are proud of excited about, want to talk about. So when I come to people's houses, and, and, and maybe I'm not sure what to talk about, I can just look at the fridge, or I can look at the frames. Harry, I love sitting with you because it's just a wall of grandkids. And you know what's awesome? We were talking last time, like, you've got to start another row with great grandkids. And it's just so cool to see, boom, there they are. And, and they've got them all around the TV, and I have a feeling they probably stare at those faces more than they do the TV screen. We care about what we put in frames. The things that we stick on the fridge are important to us, and I want to show you guys something real quick. You can see why God is so proud of them and has a city waiting for them. I 
want you to visualize a second God's bridge. You're like, I don't think he needs a bridge. He's going to have one for this visual, so just deal with it. He has the coolest bridge. I don't, that was a good pun. You missed it. Okay. Do you recognize your face is on that bridge? I mean, I just get chills thinking about this. That on God's bridge, he has placed the face, the picture, his beloved. And God sees it time after time, day after day. Some of you are like, I don't think God has a fridge. Don't worry. We're going to talk about God's hallway. If you can't deal with the fridge, we'll talk about frames. Okay? And some of you say, I don't know if he has hallways. I'm pretty sure Jesus says, in my Father's house there are many rooms. I have a feeling those rooms are connected by hallways. I'm just looking into the text. Here is the beautiful thing. As you are in that heavenly home, in that kingdom, all along those hallways, all along those walls are frames. And you recognize that what a parents do, they frame the face of their children. And I need you to look at someone right now and say, your face is in a frame in God's house. Find someone and let them know. Find someone and let them know right now. Think about this. God is so proud of them. He has a city waiting for them. Your face is in a frame in your father's house. And, and I want to say this again. God loves you. You go, uh-huh, yeah. God is proud of you. God is proud of you. And it is so awesome to just... I've, all this week I've been thinking of it, I'm like, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> there are times where I'm working on the sermon and the sermon's working on me, and I'm like, oh. God's kicked back, taking that Sabbath rest and looking at the faces of his sons and daughters. Your face is in a frame in the Father's house. Your Father is proud of you. I need to get into the why. I need to get into understanding. Some of, some of you, will, you will accept it. Like, yeah, God's proud of me. Some of you are like, I don't know. Well, here, I want you to turn into Isaiah 43. We're going to hop through Scripture because if I'm going to make a point, I'm going to show that it stands throughout Scripture. Isaiah 43. Uh, I want to hit specifically verse 4, but I, the whole chapter of Isaiah 43. If you're thinking, what chapter of the Bible am I reading this week? This one. It's a great one. If you don't like the Old Testament, I'll give you a chapter from the New Testament. You just wait. But in Isaiah 43, in verse 4, the Lord is talking about, hey, uh, we're, we're making an exchange. And he's saying, I'm trading lives for years. He's giving away uh, captive lives to, to claim, to claim some. And he says, why? Because you are precious to me. You are precious to God. You are precious. To God. You are honored. God says, I love you. And the question still remains, why am I precious? Why am I honored? If you've got your text, look back at verse 1. Verse 1 says, but now, oh Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. Oh Israel, the one who formed you. The one who formed you says, do not be afraid. I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Why are we precious? Why are we honored? We're God's children. And just for those of you that are parents, you can be watching a sporting event, and your child can be on the field picking their nose, and you as a parent are like, I'm just so proud of them. I'm just so proud of them. Like the love a parent has for a child enters into this space of, of joy, delight, honored, and, and just, I have so much pride. Pause. I know not all of us have perfect parents. I know when I talk parents, some of you are like, that's not a, that's not a touchy subject. You have 
an almighty God that looks at you on the field of life, picking your nose. And he goes, I got him in the frame. I love him. I love him. And some of you right now, you're like, no, 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 no. God knows what I do. I do. And, and so he doesn't. He's not perfect. Those of you who are parents, those of you that have been kids, you know, parents know. You are not hiding a thing from God. He knows. And he's proud of you, even when you wipe that stupid booger someplace you shouldn't. <laughs> even when you do the things you know you were told not to do, your father looks in your face and goes, I am so proud of him. Some of you say, well, I don't, I don't know. Let me, let me clarify this even more. Because verse 1 says he's proud of us. We, he's honored to have us at his children because he created us. And some would say, well, yeah, he created everyone. He created all. But we're talking about pilgrims. We're talking about those in pursuit of the Lord. So is God just proud of everyone, even if they don't care about him, even if they're walking away? Staying in Isaiah 43. Look at verse 10. But you are my witnesses, O Israel, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me, believe in me, and understand that I alone am God. There is no other God. There never has been, and there never will be. I, yes, I am the Lord, and there is no other Savior. God loves the children that are looking towards him, walking towards him, and recognize his house is their home. God is not proud of children just when they're perfect. God is not proud of children only when they make the game-saving catch or, or crush the home run. He is proud of them simply because they are his. They are his children, and they want to belong, and they want to live with him. Our Father is proud of us. He's got our faces in his frames. He smiles when he looks at his bridge. Going a little bit deeper, you guys know the story in Luke 15, but I want to hit it here for a second. Some of you in class this morning got to discuss it, but in Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal son, the lost son, as it should be said, and I know this there's some young sons and some old sons here as we talk through this. But I, I want us to look at, uh, you know what? I'm just going to read it. It's the Bible. Jesus told him this story. I'm starting in, in verse 11. He said, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. His father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. What has happened in that context is the younger son has said, I would rather have the stuff than you. And inheritance happens at death. The young son is basically saying, Daddy, you're dead to me. I'd rather have the stuff. Moving on, verse 13. A few days later, this younger son packed up all his belongings. He moved to a distant land. Here, there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time the money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. He began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the, his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs, pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. In verse 17, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home. I think there's so much weight on that phrase right there. At home. Even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Guys, we are exactly the same. When we share communion, when we come to the face of the Lord and we recognize who he is, all we can say is unworthy, unworthy, unworthy. But you know what God does? This is what he does. Let's keep reading. Verse 20. 
He returns home to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love, filled with compassion, he ran to his son, he embraced him, he kissed him, and his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and earth and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. His father doesn't even listen to him. His father says this is quick. Break the finest robe in the house. Put him on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party began. And the second the son recognized where his home was, father's proud. The second he turns his face to recognize his father, to realize, I don't want the stuff. I want you, Dad. He is immediately brought back into his place in the family. He is cherished. He is honored. His father is proud. And i got to say this. His father is proud. And I'm sure he still smells a little bit like pig slop. And let's be honest, son of us, some of us still smell a little bit like our sin conditions. That's not going to stop our father from being proud. Because we recognize where home is. Even through the messes we go through. Let me go to one more verse. This verse uh, will be up there. From Romans 8.15, Paul says, You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Pause for a second. This is faith life. This is church for many people. They claim God, and now they got to get to it. They claim God, and now they got to start doing good things. They've got to get on it. Paul says this, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Think of that demographic. That's it. I've got to do enough. I've got to do enough. I've got to do enough. And just overly scared and in fear that we're not going to do enough to receive the Father's love. I've got to do enough to receive the Father's love. And Paul says, no, you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. By whom we cry, Daddy, Father. The spirit of adoptions. The Holy Spirit, the spirit that fell upon Jesus as his baptism, is the same spirit that our Father claims us and calls us with and says, You are mine. I am so proud of you. And all we do is look in this direction and say, Daddy, Daddy. I, I want to pause for a second. Um, I need, I need, can I get some help? Can I, anyone just like, Crazy enough to volunteer to come up here? Anybody? Anybody? Josh? I figured Gabe and Aaron, you've already been up here, so you don't count. Josh, come on up. Anybody else? Anybody else dare? I mean, we got one. For a second. Kelly, come on. Come on. All right, I want you to see these little podiums. I want you to each stand. Josh, you can go right here. Okay. Kelly, stand right here. Take about a step back. Okay. All right. And close your eyes for a second. Okay, just Josh. Josh, when I say go, I want you to open your eyes and see God's pride and joy. Go. Kelly, when I say go, I want you to open your eyes and see God's pride and joy. I think we need to understand something. We are going to look at our face day after day after day. I know this is really, really good to stand here, but just soak it in for a second. <laughs> and I think the best way you can start your day, when you look yourself in the eyes. Has everyone seen, their, has everyone seen God's pride and joy yet? Do I need to angle this in any way? Tina, did you get a chance to see it? All right. I stole this from the women's bathroom. Because, <laughs> guys, we don't have that many mirrors. 
how awesome would we be as a family every day when we woke up and we looked at the mirror? We had something in there, maybe a post-it note, do it, that just said, God's pride and glory. But we tend to write a whole lot worse things and believe those lies than the truth that those that know the Father and are heading home to the Father, they're in his frame. They're his pride and joy. Thank you, God, so much. Here's the thing. The evil one, his goal is to deceive. His goal is to lie to you. He will celebrate a touchdown when it is obviously an interception. Okay? We have to understand he will do everything he can to deceive us. I want you as my family. When you wake up and you look in the mirror, there's God's pride and joy. And I know that I need to hear it, and I need to be able to say it because I can say a whole lot worse. <laughs> so I'm not a fan of graffiti, but I'm figuring like this one counts. Just, just start hitting up mirrors. God's pride and joy. I don't know if this is going to work, but uh, for you at home watching on the webcam, let me know. That's you. That's you in there. You just got to sit in that place. I'm proud of you, God. It takes a whole lot of stuff just kind of ease. But I got more. Here we go. If we're going to say our marching orders as we as pilgrims are walking forward, if we're saying one step loving God, one step loving people, one step going and making disciples. And here's, here's where a lot of us are at. You may not even recognize this, but this is what a lot of us are doing. We are thinking step three. Maybe step two, maybe if you're like that needy one. But I will say a lot of us, we look at love God and went, got it. And I want to go back to that and I want to sit there. Because you limit, you limit your ability to love God when you place limits on the love of God. When you do not allow yourself to embrace the fact that he is proud of you. You have closed, you have capped your ability to truly love God. I am overwhelmed by the love of God when I'm, I am covered in pig slop. And he's like, come on, boy. I can't believe it. To still be his pride and joy. I want to walk briefly through Matthew, and I want to double down on all of us understanding that we are God's pride and joy. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Matthew, and I'm going to say this again. You limit your ability to love God when you place limits on the love of God. And if you are sitting currently in a seat, when you're saying, when the voice in your head is saying, God's not proud of you, shut it up. Throw that one out. That is straight junk mail. Don't even take it in the house. Okay? God is proud of you. God is proud of you. I'm going to walk through three sections of Matthew and we'll be done. Matthew chapter 12. Jesus talking about his family. And uh, in verse 46, Jesus is speaking to the crowds. He had those that have turned their lives. They are aimed at him. They are walking with him, listening to him. Jesus speaking to this crowd, and his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. And someone says to Jesus, the Son of God, King Jesus. Someone says to Jesus, your mother and your brother's outside, and they want to speak to you. Now, what he's about to say is going to sound like, is Jesus being a jerk here? I want you to catch the weight of this. Jesus said, who's my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples and said, look, these are my mother and my brothers. Why? The next verse Verse 50, anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and 
mother. Let me explain this. Some of you are like, well, what's the point of this? Jesus is the Son of God. He's at the right hand of God. That's really close to God. Okay, let's just, just that's pretty close. He's saying those who do the will, what's the will of God? To love him, to know him, to walk home towards him. They are my brothers and sisters and mother. There's a framed picture of Jesus and you face is right next to it. Staying in Matthew, moving into chapter 19. In Matthew 19, we have a rich man. And the beauty of this is this story would have worked great last week, but I needed to save it for this week. Because we are going to see a man enter into the decision, do I want to be a pilgrim or do I want to be pitiful? Okay, we talked last week, it's a pity for those who care about the world. And starting verse 16, someone came to Jesus with this question, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me about what is good, Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones, the man asked. Jesus replied, must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely. Honor your father and uh, mother, love your neighbor as yourself. And the man intercedes, I've obeyed all these commandments, what else must I do? And in verse 21, Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go sell all your possessions. Give the money to the poor. You'll have treasures in heaven. Come follow me. Jesus draws a line. And he says, if it's about the stuff, it's going to be pitiful. How do we know it's going to be pitiful? Verse 22. When the young man heard this, he went away sad. Womp, womp. He went away in a pitiful mood. Why? Because he had many possessions. And that sorrow, that pity was in the fact that he wanted them and desired the things of this world. And we've got to look at this stuff and say, no, no, Lord, I want you more. I want you more. I want you more. Last one in Matthew, and we will be done. In Matthew 25, we have Jesus at the end of chapter 25. Starting verse 31. He's talking about the final judgment. And this will be our final section of scripture. Verse 31, he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence. Side note, Zach and Aaron, you are going to be overwhelmed by the presence of God's people when you are in Honduras, and I can just say from experience, it is awesome when you see brothers and sisters praising God. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll place the sheep at his right hand, the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. And I want to say this again. The King, Jesus, will say to those that the Father is proud of, that the Father honors, those that are blessed, he will say, Come, inherit the kingdom, the one you've been aimed at, the home you've been walking towards. He says, Come, come, for the Lord has prepared for you. This kingdom. And he goes on in verse 35. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And this king will say, I tell you the truth, Southgate, when you raise that money for the well, 
when you gathered all the supplies you could to pack them into cardboard boxes to place in the hands of children, that that was going to be the greatest gift they would ever receive. I will tell you when, Southgate, when you grabbed a little ribbon off of a tree, knowing that you wanted to give to someone you would never see, you would never meet, but you knew that you could give to make their life a little bit better. I will tell you, Southgate, when you have honored the Lord, when in good faith you set something in that little wooden box, and you're willing for the, the leaders of this church to do something awesome with it. And I will tell you this, there are so many times I see people with, with eyes wide open as they are given things in the name of Jesus through the money you as a congregation have given. And Jesus proclaims and praises because the Father is so proud of you because you don't live a pitiful existence saying, mine, mine, mine. We look and say, how can I give to them? Jesus says, when you did those things, you were doing it for me. When those cardboard boxes go from your hands to a child's hands, we all need to hear the voice of Jesus say, thank you. Thank you. I'd be doing a disservice if I didn't continue reading as much as I do not want to continue reading, but I am going to continue reading. Verse 41. The king will turn to those on the left and say, away with you. You cursed ones. It's the eternal fire prepared for for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. They'll reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And Jesus will answer, I'll tell you the truth. When you refused to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you're refusing to help me. They'll go away to eternal punishment. The righteous will go into eternal life. Guys, I can't talk about hell and damnation without just being broken. It would be really easy to not talk about it and not make it a real thing. Let's just skirt the whole like left side of the room. Let's not talk about that. But the love of God and the love for people, and we go, and we go, and we go. Because our Father has our picture in a frame. And guys, there are some empty frames in our Father's house. That in this life, we get to be the best advertisement for a loving Father and a loving Savior. And I don't know how you live, but I hope you live in light of eternity. I hope you live so excited about the kingdom to come. And I hope the thought of hell hurts like hell. And I will say that, and I will say that, and I will say that. We should take no joy those who will not be on the fridge, who will not be in the frame, but it should break our hearts in this day that they do not know a father and they are not walking his way. Out of the overwhelming reality that our father loves us and is proud of us, I do not want to spend my life twiddling my thumbs going, well, am I good enough? I want to be pointing and going, he is so good, he is so good, he is so good. Because 
is what a dying world needs to see and needs to hear. We're done with the sermon series. We're done with the month of November. We're done with, with talking about pilgrims, but I hope this refrain remains. Lord, I am heading your way. Lord, I am heading your way. And I hope there is a glimmer of a reality that he is overwhelmingly proud of you. That he knows you, he has called you, and your face is there in his hallway. So as you walk, God, as you walk, talk. As you walk, let people know there is a better way. As you walk, I want you to walk confidently because of the pride your Father has in you. As you walk, I don't want you to live a life concerned where you just hide uncertain. The actions we take have effect. The decisions we make have consequences and have ramifications. I want to be obedient because there is a Father that has my picture and I want to live up to the love that He has for me. So the second I realize my finger is in my nostril and I'm covered in pig slop, I want to say, God, I am so sorry. God, I want to live for you. God, I want to walk. I want to know you. I want to live and be more like you. I don't think I've shared this story, and it's a 30-second story. And we're done. As Uncle Arnold laughed about his pride and joy, I realized we can laugh in the face of death because there is no Sting. There is no sting for those that belong to it. I don't think I've shared my baptism story. I was baptized at Papaw's funeral. Kind of a weird one. People are like, well, that's weird, dude. And it wasn't because of a fear of death. It was an excitement to realize I had a father that I could look in the mirror and say, that's his pride. And I want to live for him. I want to walk in obedience to him. I want people to see an almighty God. And in some small way, I want to be an advertisement for him. Guys, I hope you keep marching. Lord, I am heading your way. I'm going to invite the worship team up. And I want to say this. If you are off the path, you don't even know what the path is. You don't even know the direction to head. That's why we have shepherds. That is their job, to lead the flock. They want to pray for you. They want to guide you. And if you are ready to walk away from a pitiful existence and stand as one proud, we want to pray for you. We want to be there for you. We want you never to forget the pride God has.